Hello, uh, my name is Sergei Naumov. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And in this talk, I'm going to present uh, the tool set that we have developed together with uh, Rogelio Oliva, a professor at Texas A&M University. And this tool set helps to understand how structure of the complex uh, nonlinear systems uh, determines the behavior that we observe. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Sergei Naumov. Uh, and today, I'm going to present um, a joint project uh, with uh, Rogelio Oliva from Texas A&M about structural dominance analysis of dynamic systems. And to give you a little bit of a background uh, where this is project is coming from, um, let me give you some uh, primer on system dynamics, so, which is the um, computer simulation approach to the analysis of complex social, economic, environmental, and other you know, human systems, and has roots in control theory, which was, uh, uh, and it was developed by Professor Jay Forrester at MIT in the uh, late 50s, who actually uh, was uh, already a very uh, prominent engineer at that time and then did a lot of work in uh, server mechanisms. And he realized that actually principles of feedback control that used in engineering, they could as well be used and very successfully used in uh, management of large scale real world systems. So, so this uh, framework, this approach that we use, that that's basically based on feedback thinking. And then on the feedback thinking, uh, we understand that basically the behavior of a system, the, the behavior that you observe, it's a uh, result, a combination of different endogenous uh, uh, sort of like interactions that occur between uh, elements in that system. And we're under feedbacks, we understand that these loops that start in, at some point in the system and then they propagate through the system uh, through a certain pathway and they return back to the original point. And as a result, they potentially change the states of the system and influence the future. So therefore, we actually are focusing uh, purely on the understanding why the system works the way it works. And uh, just to give you a little bit of the uh, very simple example, this is a classical BAS model of diffusion, uh, market diffusion of products or services uh, that has a very simple structure, just two state variables or stocks, we call them. And this is a, they're depicted as boxes. And this is a stylized pipe between, uh, represents the rate of change of those levels. And all the other variables around, these auxiliary variables, and they needed to create the pathways, those loops, to understand uh, how the variables are connected and what influences what. So this model, if you run, that generates a classic uh, S-shaped uh, logistic curve that uh, you, know, you see on the right-hand side. And this is where basically you have the exponential growth in the beginning, and then you have leveling off and the slowing down the dynamic. So it's clear that there's something going on, and then how you want to uh, understand how the system works. So the traditional methods that we use, they're largely a trial and error simulations and experiments and sensitivity analysis and scenario analysis of different sorts, where you're basically trying to discover the structures by changing parameter values and different um, combinations of them and trying to switch you know, loops on and off and trying to see which is influential when. So in this case, the model is simple, so you can really clearly understand that in the beginning there is an exponential positive uh, loop, um, reinforcing loop, that word of mouth loop, where the more people you know become adopters of the product, they uh, more so sort of like the stronger is the dynamic of converting other um, uh, ado potential adopters. And uh, in the in the middle, the dominance shifts. In other words, you know that the other loop becomes much more prominent, and this is the negative or balancing loop, which is basically exhaustion loop. So you just run out of people, and then you convert everybody. It's a very simple model, so you can actually do that uh, by hand and through different simulations. So, the problem is that if you have a large scale model, the analysis of large models is much more difficult because um, models are largely you know, nonlinear by their nature and there's a complex nonlinearities and there has a numerous feedback loops that interact at the same time, different time delays and dozens of state variables and many, many soft variables. And under soft variables, we understand the variables that are hard to measure. You can't really measure you know, fatigue or you can't really measure morale. You know, there are some approximations, so there are different dependencies, there are uncertainty in links between uh, variables that are soft in their nature. So in this uh, circumstances, traditional methods, they become an art, right? You can always you know, miss something when you analyze this model, or you can decide not to cover all parameters because it's just too computationally intensive, or you just miss something. And then even for simple models then you know what you actually decide is the uh, uh, sort of like a cause of the observed behavior you can falsely attribute that to this certain me feedback mechanisms you can decide well it's because of these loops here and there and maybe so the parameters for me to change would be X and Y and however it might be in fact uh, the result of a completely different set of uh, feedbacks uh, that is driving this outcome right so it's a it's basically uh, now becomes clear it's difficult to understand what causes the observed behavior without understanding dominance patterns relying to underlying structure of the model, right? So then we need an exhaustive analysis and something more robust and replicable than just you know, that art uh, that I've just talked about. So, so it's, it's very actually nice 
to think about from the mathematical perspective. So the system of that sort can be described as a set of n-coupled, you know, first order ordinary differential equations, and we also call them the state equations, where the rate of change of every uh, state variable in the system is a function of the other state variables and some, you know, exogenous or input variables. So given this model structure, given these functional dependencies and the initial conditions, and also the trajectories of all the input variables, so the behavior of the system is completely determined. So this is great. However, the problem is in general form, there is no analytical solution to nonlinear systems. So even with few state variables, few uh, levels, uh, they can generate very complex behavior, including even chaos behavior. So what we can do about this. Uh, so, so one of the um, uh, approaches that can be useful here is actually try to linearize this system around the operating point. And if you do that using Taylor expansion, so you can actually come to this uh, uh, sort of like a functional form where the rate of change is uh, approximately is linear combination of the uh, other state variables and the um, input variables. So for such linear system, there is a solution uh, and that's very well established in the linear control theory. So, and then the function basically, the, the, uh, the solution becomes a function of the structure defined by these matrices A and B, uh, which are matrices of the partial derivatives. So the key element now in this solution becomes the eigenvalues. So eigenvalues of that matrix A. And so then the solution uh, for, for the, um, uh, all the other um, state variables in the system becomes just a pure function of the exponents of these uh, eigenvalues where the weights uh, depend on the nature of the eigenvalues. So if the eigenvalues are complex, that would be a sign function that represents oscillation. Otherwise, it just will be the exponential trajectories. So, uh, and just to illustrate how it works, so let me just show you a very simple system. So on the left-hand side, you have the representation in the uh, differential equations, and this in the middle, this is the representation of the, uh, sort of like a structure of that system. You have two state variables, x1 and x2, and two rates of change, and one parameter, p1. So if you run that with the parameter p1 being equal to one, then you have these trajectories on the right, and both stocks, uh, they uh, erode over time. So, and now if we use the system matrix, um, uh, that matrix A that's basically written here, and if we try to compute that, so we can get the eigenvalues here in symbolic form as a function of this parameter P. And then assuming that, uh, say, P is equal to one, like I said, we have this list of two eigenvalues, and this is a real eigenvalue, so we know that now in the system there are two behavior modes that are exponential, so there is no oscillation in the system, and we can even plot these behavior modes and get something like that, right? So then basically all the trajectories of all two stocks that we see will be uh, the function or combination of this uh, behavior mode. So now the, um, the question is now you want to understand now, okay, so every trajectory of every state variable in the system is completely determined by these behavior modes. Now you want to understand what influences these behavior modes. Because if you, want, if you can do that, then you can actually understand now how can you control that, right? How, can, how you can control it properly. So this is not a very uh, new uh, idea. So it has been around since 80s. And then, but it actually didn't get too much traction because of the intentional uh, computational intensity and because of the fact that there wasn't just no simple uh, sort of like a unified um, solution how you basically co um, combine all the pieces of the system. So you have to get the model right first and then you have to uh, sort of like simulate it somewhere and you have to get the data out of that model and then you have to import that in some other software package where you basically do the analysis and then you export that somewhere else. So it wasn't really a very streamlined and uh, clear um, uh, sort of like a uh, uh, solution. So what uh, we're gonna, I'm, I'm going to show you today is that the, the work that's based in the um, uh, what we call structural dominance analysis uh, framework where we have two different pathways, uh, two different uh, parts. So one part is the what we call loop eigenvalue elasticity analysis, which is what I just showed you. It's how you under, uh, identify those behavior modes in the system. And then once you did, then how you link the uh, loops, the feedback loops in the system to the actual observed um, uh, behavior modes. So the uh, challenge here a little bit is that uh, you want to understand individual influences of each individual loop on the eigenvalues or on the behavior modes. However, uh, so there are sometimes could be overlap in the loops, you know, some links in the loop, they might participate in multiple loops. So if you want to change, let's say, uh, gain in one loop or gain basically rate of change uh, that loops this, uh, propagates around the loop, and that might nece not necessarily be affecting only one loop, it might also affect the other loops, you know, and then so then the results will not be actually clear. Uh, so there is a solution that comes from the control, uh, from the graph theory, uh, where we can actually identify independent loop set and uh, such that, you know, basically you can independently change the gain of the loops. 
So uh, the problem a little bit of here is that the independent um, uh, loop set is not unique, right? So there are multiple uh, options how you can get that, uh, that. So approach that we use is the shortest independent loop set where basically we use the loops that are shortest in, in size so that it'll have the least number of parameters. So that's one part. So once you understand which loops affect you know, the behavior modes, now you want to understand how these behavior modes basically uh, project on the state variables because now you want to understand what effect it has on the trajectories of the variables that you care about. And this is the second part that we call dynamic decomposition weight analysis, which is now using eigenvectors of the same matrix A and then gives you the projection of those eigenvalues of behavior modes, I'm sorry, not on, the, on the stocks. All right? So uh, what we have now is the uh, complete tool set, uh, fully done in Mathematica in a notebook. Uh, that has very streamlined workflow. So you have, uh, you have the model, you upload it in Mathematica, and then you do the analysis, you generate a report, and it's a single package, so it doesn't require you know, a bunch of different stuff. So the uh, sort of like all sorts of different uh, parsing and uh, you know, conversion of these functions from the modeling environment to Mathematica is done uh, sort of like here behind the, the scenes so that user doesn't see that, and it becomes very, uh, very elegant uh, sort of like an environment for people to explore models now. Right, so then let me just show you how it looks. Um, and um, so this is the dashboard that you get. And then so let's just you know try to analyze this example model that we have here. So we have this information about the structural you know composition of this model. We can run this model or simulate that we have these trajectories for both variables that we observed on the graph before. And now we can do this you know. Uh, analysis, like I said, the uh, figuring out what the behavior modes are. So this is the system that, uh, the graph that shows you there in the system there are two uh, uh, eigenvalues, two behavior modes, and they're real, and they're constant over time, so the system is very simple and that there is nothing fancy about that. We could easily understand that, uh, you know, doing the analysis by hand, but this is using, this is working for all sorts of complex systems where these interactions would be much, much more complicated. And now we can do the projections, uh, like I said, um, of the behavior modes. And if you look at that, because this is actually a linear system, that linearization that we are doing, so we have to choose at what point we're doing linearization, because again, if this is a nonlinear system, then of course the trajectory will change and linear system will only be good for around the operating point, but because this system is linear, so the actually, um, the results that we get, the decomposition we get is exactly equal to if you compare these two graphs coming from simulation and from the decomposition that we get, um, so then the equation is clearly, you know, specifying here all these components, just, you know, all these behavior modes and then the, the weights. So you get exactly this trajectory. And so once you have that, you confirm that visually. So you have this, you know, the behavior that you understand and you like. So then you can go to elasticities and then you can understand that, for example, you have only one parameter in this, you know, model P1 we, we had, we saw. And so this is the um, uh, influence of this parameter on the, on the weight and on the behavior mode itself. So we know that we, if we increase the, um, uh, this magnitude of this parameter now, so our system will actually um, uh, behave more aggressively, so it will erode quicker. You know, that will be a stronger uh, projection of the eigenvalue, uh, and then not because eigenvalue is erosion, so it will be a stronger erosion, plus the eigenvalue itself, the behavior modes uh, will be stronger. So uh, this is, uh, in a nutshell, again, this is a very simplistic model, but you can run much more complicated models here and get the same level of analysis relatively quickly. Um, so just for the um, uh, sake of completeness here, so there's some few um, uh, interface uh, related takeaways that uh, we have from, uh, from this process of converting the, you know, basically different um, uh, tools uh, into one tool set and then also improving some algorithms. So, but the interface is the important part here. So you want to have a clear, you know, flow control. And this is very simple and trivial, it might be on the surface, but in the end, what you're going to do, you're going to be, um, um, you're going to be guiding a user through the interface in such a way that there is no opportunity for people to make a, sort of like a stupid mistake or you know generate some exception in the um, in the um, in the routine. So, for example, you have this you know load and run button. I mean, you you should prevent you know run from being useful until you know load is complete. And now we have this load and then the run is running, right? So this is one part where basically you want to uh, clearly delineate uh, the the boundaries of what user can do at each uh, point in time. Um, so, and then that's pretty much self-explanatory, but can easily, you know, slip through cracks of this modeling process. So um, this is important. So the other part is message capturing, especially if you're dealing with something that you're not controlling fully. 
like you want a user uh, to upload any model, so it means that you know um, uh, mathematical functions can generate all sorts of you know response to this you know input if the input is crappy, right? So you want what you want to do if you don't want to ruin this nice dashboard that you have, and so that basically if the exceptions occur, then they will be you know listed underneath that interface. So you don't want to do that. So you're capturing this message. What it actually does, it uses this some un basically undocumented, very useful uh, um, sort of like a function, which is the in, in, uh, in inherited block which you know, uh, uh, sort of like it carries over the definitions for the function that you're passing through, and then you modify that. And what I'm doing here is basically I'm capturing all the, um, uh, capturing all the information about the uh, uh, errors that were, or messages that were generated through the, during the execution of the function, and um, I'm uh, passing it back to the uh, parameter. Uh, the, um, uh, of this function. So let's say if we have this um, uh, message as the empty list, we can put it as a dynamic variable here, and let's say if we just simply say one over zero, it will generate this uh, error infinite expression and it's put on directly in the notebook. So we don't wanna have that. If instead we use our function that captures messages, so see we evaluate that, nothing happens here in the interface, but I capture that message and I can show it in, the, in my elements of my interface where I want it to be in the windows or something. Uh, so then another one, so it actually keeps populating, right? So I can do it as long as I want. So this is something very, very useful um, we found. Um, okay, so then um, future improvements and directions. So we, you know, there are some different things that we wanna you know, do for the uh, model part, uh, including you know, parsing different you know, exotic functions and then some you know, trigonometric functions in uh, Mathematica, they are camel case, so which is not the case for the modeling environment. Usually, so we want to, you know, deal with that. So the, uh, we want to, you know, also work with a little bit more complex input uh, parameters and variables for the system because right now we are mostly focusing on the endogenous behavior, so kind of uh, abstracting away from some disturbances that might be introduced through the inputs. Uh, but the big thing we want to actually move forward here is actually trying to use machine learning control uh, for a parameter uh, uh, and then some policy design, uh, for, for example, using you know, this adaptive feed forward control in order to be able to uh, analyze more um, complicated models and get, get more insightful results. So, and another big part for us is actually moving from the uh, uh, notebook-based interface. So this is a single package, so you can actually do that uh, if you have a mathematical license, but even if you do have a mathematical license but you're not a frequent user, it might be a little bit intimidating for people uh, to start doing that just for that single task. So we want to move to the web-based interface. Uh, and this is just right now a big dynamic object, uh, so it's not really uh, very much 100% immediately portable to the cloud, um, so you have to do certain um, things about it. So you either have to modify the interface and put it in the cloud notebook, or you have to actually generate a bunch of API functions and then use the uh, uh, HTML and then JavaScript to interact with that and then display. So it's not really clear for us so which way it should go. And then we were, you know, been talking to different people. So if you have any ideas and suggestion how to do that, we uh, would be very uh, great. We'll be uh, very uh, thankful. And um, that's it for today. So if you have um, any questions, we'd be happy to answer. And thank you.